All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Family Academy session on generative AI in the classroom and beyond. My name is Ronnie Shoa, and I'm the Supervisor for Communications and Engagement. And I'm excited to have, have you guys here um, to explore this rapidly evolving technology. Generative AI or artificial intelligence creates content such as text, images, videos, and even music is becoming increasingly integrated in our daily lives, including the educational environment. Today, we'll dive into what generative AI is, how it's being used in the classrooms, and how we as a community can support responsible and effective use of this powerful tool at home. We'll continue the basics, we'll cover, excuse me, the basics, discuss potential benefits and challenges, and provide tips on how you can help guide your child in navigating this new technology. Any questions that you have throughout the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the, the Q&A section of the presentation and we will um, we'll leave some time towards the end of the presentation to um, discuss those. Um, so let's go ahead and get started and I will pass it off to our presenters. Thank you, Ronnie. Yes, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, it's always nice to have a group of people join us. Um, after hours when you could be doing a number of other things, but um, putting this forth, putting this first and um, supporting your students, our teachers and our classrooms are really important. So um, I'll begin by introducing myself. My name is Kristen Barr. I am the supervisor of instructional technology, innovation and information literacy. And with me this evening, Hi, everyone. I'm Jackie Worstel. I'm the coordinator of instructional technology and personalized learning. So just to reiterate a little bit of what Ronnie <laughs> already mentioned that we'll be covering, we're going to start with an introduction to generative AI. Um, this will be kind of a layman's term understanding of generative AI, what it is, the background and basics. This is an ever evolving technology. And so um, keeping that in mind as we talk about how students might use it, teachers might use it, and um, the resources that are available, those will be ever updated. So um, we'll provide you with some resources where you can kind of keep your finger on the pulse of where things are within our division. So we'll start with the basics, then talk about responsible student use, and end with those resources. So to begin, Jackie has a little bit of an opener for us. So we'll put a poll up here, but um, Jackie, take it away. Yeah, so we're gonna start with a little bit of a soft entry into introducing AI and kind of ground us in reality of what it's capable of. So up on the screen, we're gonna look at four images. You should see four images of little babies. Your objective right now, in just a moment, you should see a poll pop up and try and decide which one is the AI generated image. So um, I realize that these don't have numbers on them. So just go from left to right. So the first one being number one, um, the next two and three and four. So go ahead and cast your vote in the poll. We'll take a second. All right, we're getting some staggering opinions in the poll results. All right, if you have last second entries, go ahead. Otherwise, we're going to call it in three, two, one. <laughs> All right. The correct answer was number two. Baby number two is the AI generated res or um, image. You should see the results up on your screen as to which the most popular answer was, and that was number three. Um, that is actually Kristen's lovely baby, or I guess son. <laughs> He's not a baby anymore, but yes, that is my oldest son. You got two of your babies here, and then my baby is over here on the left. So those were not the AI-generated photos. We're going to go ahead and go to the next slide. Try and look at these lovely displays of charcuterie boards. Take a peek at them and which one is the AI generated charcuterie board? And again, these ones aren't numbered. So again, just go from left to right. Um, the first being number one, the middle being number two, and the one on the furthest to the right being number three. Okay. 
All right, we'll take about 10 more seconds. We are split 50-50 right now. As well, we need a few more people to weigh in. <laughs> Break the tie. <laughs> All right, got a front runner. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And the leading response was number one was the AI generated image. And that is correct. <laughs> the first image here is the AI generated charcuterie board. And we have one more. This last one actually is not an image. So this is text. So on the left hand side, you will see a poem short poem and then on the right hand side you will see a longer poem take about a minute it might take you a little bit longer for this one to just kind of read through it or sift through it and decide which one of these is the ai generated poem is it the one on the left or the one on the right and if you're familiar with the author you may just know offhand which one is the real one and ronnie are you able to post the poll for this one Sure. Yeah, this one's. I think so. It says it's been launched, but I'm not seeing results like we did in the other one. So we may have some technical, dif <clears throat> excuse me, difficulties on this one, but. Which would be fine. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and share the results. So the poem on the right-hand side is the AI-generated poem. The one on the left-hand side is actually by well-known author Shel Silverstein, or Stein, everyone says his last name differently. Um, so you look at the right-hand, so I used to be an English teacher, so something that caught my eye right off the top were just a couple of... Um, typos or grammar issues. So like, so should have had a comma next to it. So those were just things that I kind of quickly scanned for when I was looking at it. Um, but a lot of people who say, who have gotten to know AI generated content have kind of said there's something that they can't really put their finger on, but they just kind of can see or um, see like a veil almost that makes it look or feel more AI generated. Like the per person behind it has been removed. Um, so Moving forward in our presentation, we're going to be taking more of a look into what exactly AI is and machine learning and how that has kind of shaped our direction in WJCC with where we've gone with teachers and students. And one thing to note, Elena, if you'll just go back really quickly, there are some citations on this slide because yes. as our students would be expected to do, we wanted to share you know, credit where credit is due. So we have the poem citation, as you may be familiar with uh, text citation, but there also are recommendations for citing work that was generated from artificial intelligence. And so that's the APA format, but there's also MLA and all the other different organizations that have um, standards for citing work. And so um, as we talk about responsible use and ethical use, just knowing that there is some guidance out there from these large, you know, published reputable um, organizations is important, and that's something that we will stress and um, guide students on in terms of responsible use. So more on that later, but I just wanted to highlight that example um, while we had it showing for you. Okay, so again, starting with the basics with what is generative AI, um, to understand that we need to think about what artificial intelligence or AI is in general, and that is when machines are completing tasks that are typically performed by humans. So we encounter AI on a daily basis and we've really become quite accustomed to it. When we go to Netflix, it says, here are some recommendations based on the other shows that you've watched. Or we use GPS and they tell us when we've made a wrong turn and redirect us. Um, our text predictors when we are typing in Word or in Google searches, things like that are all artificial intelligence. And generative artificial intelligence, as again, Ronnie kind of mentioned in the beginning, is when the artificial intelligence actually has an output. It has a product that it's offering to the user. 
So that can include text, like we just saw with the poems. We It can include audio, video, images, code, um, songs, and more. So the really, the sky's the limit. And we kind of point out here that right now we're using artificial intelligence in its simplest and most basic form. It's only going to get better from here, um, so to speak. And so um, who knows what it will be able to to create or contribute to in the future. But um, the gap is filled there with machine learning and deep learning. So um, the people who developed ChatGPT, which kind of famously was launched in November of 2022 and one of the first publicly available generative AI sites, um, they trained their artificial intelligence on a, a huge data set. And Jackie's going to talk a little bit more about that. And then kind of continued with that so that it started to mimic human speech patterns and behaviors so that it could generate something um, in the likeness of what a human might produce. So um, Jackie is going to talk a little bit more about those two concepts there in the middle, bridging the gap between artificial intelligence and the generative artificial intelligence. So as Kristen mentioned, um, machine learning and AI is something that um, can be very complicated to understand. And there's lots of research papers and infographics and articles and whatnot that you could really dive deep into to try and understand how um, machine learning works. But put quite simply, um, very similarly to people, AI learns by being shown and having unlimited access to lots of examples and finding and recognizing patterns and improving with feedback. So what is available on the internet is essentially available to an AI or a um, generative AI robot, and it can quickly scan the internet for whatever's out there and generate content based off of that. So AI will quickly copy, it can remix, and it can synthesize information from what is accessible on the internet, which isn't always accurate or true. So consider what is published on the internet um, coming from all sorts of different authors. Um, now, some of which are even AI generated authors, but consider that not everything, and just be mindful of that not everything on the internet is necessarily true or accurate, um, which means technically that a gen generative AI response or output that it gives you might not necessarily be true or accurate as well. And then the last thing to just kind of remember and consider is that at least as of now, um, ChatGPT and our big generative AI bots aren't giving citations and references to the research and information or resources as to where it's pulling its information from. And that is because it's synthesizing so much information and putting it into one quick little summary or a long summary, depending on what kind of prompt you put in. So consider that it's not necessarily going to tell you where the information is coming from um, and so it's our job really to make sure and fact check the output of which it's giving us. So to take a step back, we're going to, at least I'm going to try and guide us through an activity that kind of models machine learning in its most basic format. And this is something that actually we've um, shown to teachers to show our students because it's a very accessible entry point into understanding how machines learn. So if you give me just a second, I'm going to pull up an activity called Google Quick Draw. This is something you could do at home with your kids. Um, your students may even be familiar with it. So I'm just going to stop sharing for just a moment. And... All right. So again, you can go to I mean, if you type in Google, if you type in Google Quick Draw, this is what will come up. And so if any of our attendees on here are familiar with Pictionary, it very much works like that. This Google robot is going to give me a prompt or something to draw. And in a matter of, I think it's, now I can't remember how many seconds, but in a matter of seconds, it's going to try and guess what I am drawing. And then we're going to kind of pull back the curtain after that and see exactly how it's learning. So here we go. I'm going to click let's draw. Oh boy. All right. It wants me to draw pliers. So I got 20 seconds to try and draw pliers. Here we go. 
<laughs> I see line. Or clarinet. Oh, I know. Scissors. It's pliers. Okay, I got it. Here we go. Headphones. I see circle. Or moon. Or music note. <laughs> it doesn't or toilet. Like a music note. Oh, I know. It's headphones. All right, we'll do one more. A harp. I see line. Or water slide. Or nose. Or shoe. Or tent. Oh, I know. It's harp. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop. It wants me to draw. You can see at the top it says it wants me to draw six drawings, but I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I'm going to exit out. So you could do all six if you wanted to. But the cool part about this, I think the most valuable part of this website, is it actually shows you the data set behind the scenes. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the world's largest doodling data set. And you can see here that over 50 million drawings have been submitted to this Google database. So just quickly scrolling down, these are just um, a few of them that have been submitted. And if I click on any one of these, so this is a jacket, it'll show me every drawing that has been submitted of a jacket. And the great part about this is that in terms of machine learning, this robot scans this database of patterns and ja of jackets and how people draw them in a matter of seconds and recognizes how you have started to draw a jacket and then be guesses based off of this data set. So to me, this is pretty incredible because this is an example of a generative AI robot that is actually showing you what's going on behind the scenes. Chat GPT doesn't necessarily do that, but just know that in a matter of seconds or um, however long it takes, it can scan an entire database worth of information and give it accurate or what it deems to be accurate information. So I'm going to go ahead and... Sorry. Yeah, go well, ahead. I think one thing um, to note here too is that these are all what people contributed. So if we read the fine print of Google Quick Draw, it would probably say that all of our drawings would be submitted to the database and talk about the how it's being used and that it's like the largest research project in this area, et cetera. Most people don't read that fine print, but the fact of the matter is, is we're contributing to that knowledge base now. And I think that's one thing to really emphasize with your children and with um, you know, our teachers emphasizing with students is that when you input these things, it's not like you're doing a Google search. You're actually contributing to that background knowledge set that that chatbot is going to use for future reference and for future learning. So um, sometimes when you hover over these, it'll tell you where it was contributed on what day and, and that sort of information. So, um, oh, there we go. That was drawn in the United States on March 28th, 2017. So most of us became aware of this relatively recently within the last two years, but in actuality, this technology has been available for longer than that. So um, just another thing that I kind of like about this is you can see that these are obviously drawn by participants. Um, and so that I think drives that point home a little bit as well for students that they are, the machines are remembering, so to speak, um, and keeping that information that they input to later access for output. Okay, so what happens when it gets it wrong? So it thought that Jackie, and no offense, it thought your harp was a nose and a water slide and all of those other things first. So um, Jackie was the brave one who said that she would draw because especially when trying to draw with a mouse, it's difficult. So um, we do appreciate that. But there are three main aspects of um, misinformation or misleading information that is referenced when we have to talk about um, generative AI or that we need to remember. So bias is first what Jackie mentioned, the prejudices and preferences within the data or information that AI draws from is going to also be reflected in the output. So remembering that it's drawing from the information available on the internet. And while we like to believe that everything we read on the internet is true, we know that that just isn't the case. So um, we know that it's drawing from perhaps biased information, but we also know that it was created ultimately by someone who has implicit biases themselves. So no matter how middle of the road or you know neutral someone tries to be when they create something, 
they have a, a background and um, experiences that they draw from. And so just naturally, there is some implicit bias. And that's going to also be included in how that chatbot functions. Hallucinations, it's a term that's still used a bit, but it's kind of going out of fashion, so to speak. But it's when, J it's when generative AI creates output that's not really grounded in reality. It's going through all of those patterns and its processes to scan all of that information within seconds and kind of fills in gaps with what it thinks should be there or makes predictions or extrapolations based on the patterns that it is seeing within the, the data set. So um, hallucinations can end up with just incorrect, distorted, or unrealistic outputs that to the user may not seem to be that. Um, it certainly won't indicate, I couldn't find this, so this is my best guess. It still tells them the information as if it were fact, so to speak. And then finally, misinformation um, is what it sounds like, inaccurate, false, or misleading information. And a lot of times that's because Generative AI doesn't have context. So people, as we search our memories or when we try to reference things, we have a context around our questions. We have a context around our memories and, and where we are getting our information from. And the computer is very literal. So some things can be misaligned, especially words that have multiple meanings. So one example might be if a student wanted information about inflation and it just says, I have an assignment about inflation. Can you tell me what that means? Are we talking about an economics term or are we talking about science and gases and and inflating something like a, a material? It won't know that. So when a student, and that's kind of a very basic example, it would be obvious if you got the wrong result and students would be able to, and part of what our teachers are going to eventually try to guide our students on is how we can ask good questions so that we do have some of that context and we do get the results that we want, but that's a skill um, that will need to be learned just like writing is a skill, speaking is a skill and things along those lines. And so um, misinformation can result based on sometimes ineffective questions um, or a lack of context. So we produced some examples because it's just kind of fun um, to do those things. And so one that kind of went viral just last weekend was that ChatGPT was getting this question wrong. How many R's are in the word strawberry? And it tells us two. And by my count, there's three. <laughs> so in this case, it's obvious we can count the R's, but if there were a question that were a little bit more complex, we may not know that the information that was generated or the output was inaccurate. Um, we have another charcuterie board picture that didn't make our cut for our example. Um, but if we look there, that um, is that bread or a rolling pin? So it filled in a little bit of that picture with what it thought should be there. <laughs> not the most appetizing loaf. <laughs> with that misshapen little handle there, but I guess maybe effective for carrying it around. Um, so sometimes it can produce things like that. And then finally, we have this prompt. We asked it to create a mnemonic for the days of the week. And it said, certainly, here's a mnemonic. My very educated mother just served us noodles. So a mnemonic is a memory tool. And oftentimes each word so those aren't the days of the week. Does anybody know, and we don't have the chat on, but does anybody know what that is a mnemonic for? I'm a teacher, so I can have silent wait time. I'm good with it. It's the planets from closest to the sun going out. So my, Mercury, V, Venus, educated, Earth. So that's an acronym. It's a mnemonic, but it's not for the days of the week. And then it explains that each initial letter in the sentence corresponds to a day of the week, but it's not using the letters of the words that were above, and it includes a U for Sunday. Um, so just lots of things off here in terms of the output. And it even says right below that chat GPT can make mistakes, so make sure that you check important information. And that certainly is highlighted with these results. So um, these are just a few quick examples of the types of things that happen or that can be produced when 
the machine just gets it wrong. Okay, so this brings us to with just the mindset of if uh, if you can think of a generative AI robot more as an assistant as an opposed to a replacement, I think you are using it in more of a productive way. So um, when we start thinking of AI replacing what our brains can do, I feel like that's where we're going to start to stumble upon not using it in the most productive and efficient and meaningful way, especially in our classrooms with our students when our teachers are trying to model good practice with AI. So these are just a few examples. So consider it as a personalized tutor. So explaining concepts and answering inquiring questions in real time, not necessarily instead of instead of asking it to generate an essay on the Great Gatsby, maybe asking it questions about the Great Gatsby in the time period and the context. And so asking inquiring questions to try and better understand your knowledge as opposed to having it replace what you would do um, as an original work. You can use it as an editor. So having it give feedback and suggestions on submitted writing, um, you can submit your writing or you can submit ideas and it will give you feedback. And then also just considering it as a thought partner to brainstorm, um, to begin a project or paper or helping to strengthen just as an example, argumentative writing by presenting opposing arguments. There's all sorts of ways in which um, you can use a generative AI bot to help you brainstorm or flesh out ideas on something that doesn't necessarily mean replacing an original work with um, some of our students might be more inclined to use it that way, but this is where you know good teacher education behind what AI is and how it can be used is really gonna come into the forefront here in order to help our students better understand how it works and how to use it appropriately. We wanted to outline here just some of the resources that students use that feature AI that aren't ChatGPT or that aren't specific tools that are very obviously um, generative AI. So. Microsoft has Copilot that's embedded in a lot of its product and its Bing searches, but then also um, it has generative AI in all of the Office suite. So in PowerPoint now, when you start creating slides, it'll offer design su suggestions so that you can create um, a background or a formatting. In Microsoft Word, it has predictive text. It has a lot of features of AI or generative AI within um, the Microsoft tools. When we look at search engines, that picture of um, the Google search there from what is generative AI, you'll see the first result now is not Wikipedia. It used to be that there was always the Wikipedia summary that had what whatever topic was that was more or less always the first result that um, you would get from a a search in the search engine, but now it's got the AI overview with highlighting of what it considers to be the main idea or the important points. So um, this is Google, but Bing has the same feature with Copilot. So um, students are encountering this. You are probably encountering it, whether you realize it or not, because a lot of people just look at the text and miss that little AI overview notation there. Um, but it's there. So we'll talk about this again in just a bit um, when we when we think about some considerations. But this is something that we're encountering on a daily basis without creating a chat GPT account, without creating a specific account at websites where you're saying, write a paper, give me tutoring, do this, do that, whatever students may do, um, or what people are concerned that students may be doing. It's available in a lot of our widely used resources. Teachers um, are using Canva and Padlet in terms of interactions and some student engagement type tools, and those have features of generative AI. So um, just making note of the availability of the technology in tools that are used on a daily basis outside of those things that are specifically what we are thinking of when we hear that term. 
Okay, so um, at the bottom of the screen, before I get into the infographic, you'll see that this infographic is taken from AI for Education, which is a website that has been referenced throughout this presentation. Chris and I um, really like it and has a lot of really great resources for our teachers, especially um, that they can use both for themselves and for their students in the classrooms. Um, but this is an infographic that outlines how to use generative AI in a response. not just taking the output for what it's giving you, but to make sure that it is appropriate for what your purpose and your intention is. To verify the facts, figures, quotes, and data using reliable sources. So again, in Kristen's example with inflation, to make sure that not only is the information accurate by fact checking, but also to make sure that it is aligning with the purpose. Edit your prompt and ask follow-up questions to have AI improve your output. So maybe your first question or your first um, statement to help you brainstorm wasn't necessarily giving you the results that you were looking for. Go back in and edit and revise and make it more clear so that you can get a more clear and accurate result. And then revise the results to reflect your unique needs, style, and or tone. So this part I feel like is extremely important um, for anyone using a generative AI robot, but you're not supposed to, you know, just copy and paste what it gives you. Make it your own, add your voice, um, tailor it to exactly what your personal needs are with whatever you are trying, with whatever topic you are trying to um, create. And then you, you are responsible for everything you create. So this part really is the ownership part. So whatever you're putting in and whatever you're taking out, you are responsible um, for making it your own, fact checking it before turning something in or trying to pass it off as your own. Um, and then as Kristen mentioned in our in one of our first slides, being transparent when you use AI, we ask our teachers to do that and it's important for them to model that with their students too, um, to not just pass something off as their own, but to give it a citation and explain that AI has been used and how it's been used and why they turn to it. Um, so keep that in mind and this is something that um, we've given as a resource to our teachers and have provided them to provide to their students too. And so some special considerations when um, thinking about using this tool and this resource, and that really is what we're considering it, a tool and a resource to be used to support teaching and learning. Um, again, just to reemphasize, it's not to replace writing skills, it's not to replace research skills, um, but it's there to support student work and student learning. Um, and just a, another note, the difficulty with this tool is that it was released to all populations at the same time. So as we are working with guidelines and supports for students, we're also working to educate our teachers. And so, of course, we have different levels of comfort with the tool with the technology, different levels of understanding. So I have observed teachers at the high school level teaching about generative AI, what it is, what it does, topics very similar to what we've covered here today. Um, there was one lesson that I um, observed where they were doing some career research and they asked generative AI about um, how that resource might be used in a field of interest or um, different information around their career interests and trying to make it applicable to the student's interests, but then also seeing some of this in action and looking at the, the conversation after some of the searches were about validity. It was about um, the accuracy of the information and how much information was given. And the teacher asked, like, do you know where they pulled this information from? Do you know where that, you know, and they had those conversations about the references and, and the database. But there are also certainly teachers who have very little um, interaction with it and they're still learning it and trying it and testing it. So before broaching that gap with the students, they're gonna need a little bit of practice with it. So um, when we talk about things like using the tools with teacher permission and being transparent, 
Um, that's going to look different with different teachers, different age groups, and um, different content areas. So someone like a technology or computer teacher might be much more ready to include guidelines, recommendations, or digital citizenship around this topic than um, teachers who um, teach other subjects or have other focuses. So um, when we think about using the tool, um, it's important to think about the age guidelines from the tool itself. So websites all have privacy policies in terms of service. And our teachers, by and large, um, won't ask a student under the age of 13 to create a chat GPT account because they're under the age of 13. And in the terms of service, it says that users have to be at least 13 years of age. And then between 13 and 18, they should have parental permission. And so our teachers probably will not be asking them to create that particular uh, to, uh, an account in that particular tool. But um, that's an example where at home, those are guidelines that are good for you to be aware of and to follow too. So websites always have um, usually links at the bottom to their terms of service. And I usually just do a quick search um, for words like age or 13 or 18, like those numbers typically will tell you if there's age restrictions around those. And we do strongly recommend that at home you abide by those as well. Um, being careful not to include personal information is of the utmost importance. So we saw how these chatbots store information and then reference it later. And so if part of the input to the um, generative AI includes personal information, it's going to stick back there to be referenced for future output. And there are more people using that tool than just your student or yourself or our you know, community. And so we want to be very, very aware of the information that we're putting out there so that it's not later included in output that we don't intend for it to be. So um, that's always a very important thing just in general for internet safety and guidelines. It's That's important that students aren't sharing personal information and things along those lines, but um, it certainly does apply here. And then um, teacher permission. So as we continue to grow with this, as we continue to have professional learning around generative AI, you may see it included in syllabi where it, it says what expectations are just like expectations around plagiarism um, are included in syllabi, particularly in secondary classrooms. Um, teachers may include it in project or paper instructions or in rubrics that say you can use generative AI for this purpose or during this phase of the project, but then not in other aspects. And being sure to recognize and honor those permissions, just like you would, again, with plagiarism or any other use of resources um, and doing so in a way that has integrity. Um, and just being mindful that it is ever evolving. And so we are keeping up as much as we can with all of the different changes that are occurring with it and the recommendations um, as a division, but then also at each school level and based on subject area, age, all of those sorts of things, um, being aware of how this may impact um, work in the classroom. And I will say, it's not on here, but as you are supporting students or teachers may um, have conversations about proof of if something was generated by generative AI. And the thing with generative AI is that you will, can put the same prompt in multiple times and every time you'll get a different result. So it's going to draft a different output, different wording, different word choice, different you know, background references each time, again, not telling the user where it's garnering that information, but it's not replicable. So as um, a teacher, if I thought something were copy and pasted from another source, or I was familiar with Shel Silverstein, I may know what poem was which in that first example, but 
if I copy and pasted that second poem and put it into the internet, I wouldn't get a source. It would look original because there isn't another place for it. There isn't a place where that poem exists outside of that chatbot response. So um, like Jackie said, there are some telltale things like um, grammar and sentence structure and things along those lines. I will say we've done a lot of research into the detectors that are available online and by and large, they're not accurate, um, especially when we talk about technical language or um, when we have students of varying writing ability, you know, younger writers are going to naturally write simpler sentences than older writers or more experienced writers. And one of the aspects of something that's generated by an AI bot is that it tends to be kind of a simpler, more direct, more straightforward sentence structure without a lot of, you know, flourish and different um, creative aspects, unless of course you ask it to add those things. Um, but it's then harder to say with certainty if something was used outside of the permissions or outside of the parameters. And so what we really recommend both for our teachers, but then also for, for you at home as you're supporting your students' decisions in how they use this technology and these resources, or if, if they do or if they don't, is to just have the questions. So if there's a word, if there's writing, and our teachers ask students to write many, many, many writing samples. So a lot of times teachers get used to how a student writes, just like you get used to how a student speaks or how they produce other types of work, artwork and things along those lines. And so there are times that teachers will read something and you just think, this doesn't seem right. Like this doesn't seem like how Kristen has written for the past three or four months. There's a word in here that we've never, we've never covered. Like I asked them to write a paper about World War II and they're bringing up aspects of, you know, a battle or a war. We didn't talk about that battle. Like why would they include, you know, X, Y, Z when that really, it has no place within where we, yes, it's true, but it doesn't fit. And so it's the place to start a conversation and just ask about it. Can you tell me more about this battle? Like, why did you include it? Where did you find this information? Because some people, students, we it's a teacher's dream for them to be excited about a topic, and then go home and do some research on their own and add that into their working knowledge of a topic. That's wonderful. But then they should also be able to speak to it if you had a conversation and say, hey, we, we didn't cover that. What does this word mean? Tell me what you meant in this paragraph. Don't accuse, don't ask things as if you're already presuming that they've done something dishonest, but instead have it as a starting point for a conversation. Um, and oftentimes that will allow for, you know, a determination as to if something were a student produced work or something that was really more heavily written by um, by generative AI. So. Um, I want to, it's not on here, but I wanted to kind of add that because you can do a quick search and find um, generative AI detectors and it will tell you an estimate of a percentage that they guess was generated by AI. Um, our technology integration team has done some exploration of that where we've put the same sample text in a number of those and they're not consistent. The results are not consistent and they're not always accurate. Sometimes it tells us that what was written by the human was written by AI and sometimes the opposite happens. And so um, we don't recommend that our teachers or you at home as you're supporting your students, again, take that as kind of definitive proof, but again, a place to start a conversation and find out more. Um, and then based on that conversation, you know, help with either digital citizenship or, um, you know, whatever might naturally come as a result of that. All right, so as we kind of wrap up our session, we didn't want to leave you guys high and dry. We want to make sure you have some resources to take away with you because I'm sure um, you probably still have many questions and or maybe this um, presentation has sparked more questions or interest in um, artificial intelligence. So 
One thing is we are now going to have a live public WJCC generative AI web page. So I'm going to go ahead and share that with you all so you can see, um, be the first to see what it looks like. So on my screen now, you should be able to see um, the generative AI web page on our WJCC schools website. You can see we have a definition of it. More or less, most of this is what we have gone over in our presentation today in more depth and detail with you all. And then just scrolling down all the way at the bottom, you will see more information of resources that you can use at home to help your better understanding of artificial intelligence. Um, and then just going back to our PowerPoint, we have included those resources on this PowerPoint as well. So the ones that are listed at the bottom of the public facing page are there as well. And then if you have a phone readily available, you can scan the QR code to take you to the website as well. So I'll go ahead and um, turn it over to Kristen. I don't know if there was any last minute wordy words you wanted to say before we no, hop we off. Have, you know, we have about 10 minutes left. We haven't received any um, typed questions in the chat. So if you have, or in the, sorry, in the Q&A section. So if you have some after this, feel free to post them, but that's what we had um, prepared. And we do thank you again for joining us. I know it's hard on a weekday evening to um, dedicate time, but we certainly do appreciate it. And we appreciate your support as we navigate this, this ever-changing field. Um, it's been a challenge, but it's been very interesting and most days fun and informative for us. And as we learn, we're passing that along to teachers and then eventually your students and to you in the community. So thank you so much for your interest. And we'll stick on here um, for a few minutes. Um, and without any other questions, we'll, we'll just sign off. And I do believe there is a survey towards the end. So we'd love to hear um, feedback as to this presentation, any other questions or, you know, future follow up. So thank you so much. Okay, so some questions in the chat that we'll just kind of discuss because they're a little bit similar in terms of just how WJCC teachers will use AI in in school and by students. Um, and right now, so no, chat GPT is not something that we recommend for use. Um, we do use Microsoft tools um, and we have a couple of generative AI tools such as Magic School AI and School AI that teachers can use as um links to send to their to their students um, in a very prescribed fashion and also see how they're interacting with it. So some of those tools are specifically created for K-12 education. And so those are what we're recommending teachers use. And um, we have not had, had polling of teachers to see um, what the opinion is. I think the fact of the matter is that students are using it. Um, just like students are using the internet and students are using other tools that are available. And so it's our responsibility um, to at least address it in terms of digital citizenship. And then I think how it's used will vary again by age, by content and by the, um, by the community, by the, the nature of the students in the classroom. So um, depending on the topic, it may be used more often in some classrooms and it may be used never by uh, you know other classrooms and so um right now we don't have anything that says it will be used in this manner you know 100 percent across the board because that just doesn't fit um but we are again just as we can educating our teachers about how and when it might be appropriate for use in their classroom we kind of liken it to calculators and math um as a comparison when calculators continue to get more and more advanced. 
teachers were worried that, you know, students were putting in the formulas and their calculators and cheating in that way and having it, they said, kids will never understand numbers. But it's kind of settled down where we know there's guidance for when teachers can allow calculators and when they don't and for what tasks they are allowed and what they aren't. And that may vary by the day or the class or, you know, the student. So um, we are expecting the tool to advance and end up in that kind of area. But again, it's evolving. Um, and so as much as we need to, we'll kind of respond and keep our, our finger on the pulse there. Well, so Christine, um, I'll just add to that in terms of our faculty, I feel like this past year really has been a year of educating our teachers and our teachers becoming more educated about AI and also exploration. So just kind of learning more about it and that way they can form a more accurate opinion as to how it could be used responsibly by themselves or by students in the classroom. So um, maybe that might be something we do in the future in terms of getting opinions of our faculty. But this past year really has been this past school year anyways was a year of um, really educating our teachers and having them explore and learn more about it. And then the last question is what AI detectors are teachers using? Um, again, we we don't have really firm recommendations because they just aren't accurate. At the high school level, we do have um, Turnitin as an option for teachers. We've had it for years as a plagiarism checker and a kind of academic integrity type resource. And then part of their evolution was to include an AI detector. So that's part of the information that teachers get if they have um, students submit through that tool, which um, again, varies more English teachers use that tool than teachers in other content areas. Um, anecdotally, AP teachers who have students writing again, like longer works are using that tool more often than math teachers. I don't know that I, you know, off the top of my head can think of a math teacher who asks for submissions through Turnitin. Um, but that is one that at the high school level we have licensing for. That's an area where we are waiting for there to be something that that is reliable and valid to be able to make a firm recommendation. So um, that's where that one stands as it is as it is now. And we will have this um, available to watch again. We plan to have the link as the next bullet point on that resource list. Um, and then it also will be, I believe, and Ronnie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, in the playlist for the Family Academy on our YouTube channel. So WJCC Schools has a YouTube channel that has a section for our Family Academies, and this should be available there. Yes, you are correct. Um, so we'll add it to YouTube. We will add it to the Generative AI page. Um, and then if you're subscribed to our newsletter, we will share a recording of that as well um, at our when we release our next newsletter.